Welcome to Conversations with Toy, a blogcast tackling life one episode at a time. This is the time to air out life's craziest moments. This space is all about speaking about life's hang-ups and ways in which we can leave better than when we started. Topics are all about ways we can find space to be better in life, love, mental space and health. Happy Friday. I am, first of all, just glad for all of us to be able to come together. I don't know what making it through the Friday means to you, but it means so many different things for, you know, each and every last one of us. For me, if I can just do a quick check in, I would say my week has been going pretty fast. I haven't had too many issues this week. Uh, My husband has been on vacation for a little bit. And so we decided to take some a couple of social distancing uh, day trips here in in our city of Philadelphia. And for me, that's huge because I have been extremely, I won't call it paranoid, but I will say very cautious about how we move as a family. So, you know, it's a lot of these places say that, oh, we're practicing social distancing. But then, you know, when I'm reading things, I'm like, no, that's not really, really what it was. But we were able to get out to a couple of, of things. And luckily, blessedly I should say not luckily but blessfully we were able to do so and it was complete social distancing um my family we made you know the conversation with our children that we wanted to be sure that they understood that we were going to enforce social distancing around us and our children to the fullest extent and I was glad that we didn't have to like go out of our way to do it but we were able to still be somewhat normal but very cautious but not paranoid and that was a blessing because we're probably going to spend the rest of the summer at home as we prepare for online school. Now, last time I had been talking these last few weeks, it's always been what's going to happen now for my school. They're still, they go to a Catholic school and they're going to be going to school five days a week in the classroom. That's just what it is as of right now. I've gotten permission for my kids to do online, which means they will kind of be like online at home, but they will plug into their classroom because my kids have asthma and I'm not comfortable with them going into the classroom I'm not comfortable even if they didn't have it but I'm definitely not comfortable now that 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 they do have it and they've had it for years so I'm glad to have enough peace that I can report that I was able to get them to be online Um, I hope that all the parents who choose for their kids to be online can have that and have that option I know that it's not ideal every parent situation cannot um, work through online situation but I can and I'm grateful to have that opportunity to do so and I'm grateful for this space in my time in my life where I have complete control over my schedule and with that I'm also grateful that I have the opportunity to make sure that they're good so we're here it's a Friday what um my weekend plans are going to be pretty pretty relaxed my anniversary my anniversary is this Sunday celebrating eight years of marriage so we're going to talk about in, a, in celebration of those eight years, we're going to talk about relationship. But before we get to that, I wanted to give an update. So Tamar was able to make her own statement on Thursday that stated basically that she had been going through for the last 11 years. She had written basically the network. And, you know, with reality TV, which I never understood. Again, this is just from me being from the outside looking in the amount of craziness that some people will allow themselves to go through to be on reality television, whether that was, in my opinion, doing things that just didn't seem honorable to allowing certain things and storylines to be made. And even if they were true, just how we blossomed these storylines, because again, drama sells. Now I've stopped watching a lot of reality, reality television personally for the last couple of years. And that was, again, my personal choice. And I don't look down on others who choose to do, who choose not to do that. But it just seems like a lot of stuff going on in the background just to, you know, just for, for money. So Tamar came out and stay, stated that, you know, she had been trying to get out of her contract or try to figure out how to make the show be reminiscent of who she, who she wants to be or who she is. And she feels that she's been exploited. Her story has been exploited. The things that she has been through has been exploited. And I'm just grateful that I'm hoping that whatever statement was put out, that it was put out by her. 
it does seem like it might have been. And I'm praying that everything will come together where she can be able to get the healing that she needs. And I'm hoping that they, just anybody that's in that field that doesn't want to be in it can find something else that they could do that can be a voice, but doesn't have to be so much, so much drama. Because drama for me, which is one of the reasons why I stopped watching reality TV, I had so much drama in my own personal life. And I'm like, I'm watching their drama unfold while my drama is unfolding. And it's like, I didn't want to have that drama filled life. That was me. That might not be you. Some people can separate it, right? Some people can separate it as purely entertainment. Some people take it in and they just don't realize that they're taking in all this craziness into their spirit. And then they are acting they're acting out because of it. So for me, I just did what was best for me and just stopped it all together. So I'm just hoping that she gets her care because again, we've been talking about mental health. And again, because of the highlight of again, Tamar Braxton and Kanye West, Kanye is still not doing well. He hasn't had any, at least any public carrying on in the last couple of days. But you know, that those manic, you know, those bipolar moments can be fleeting. They can be really high. They can be really low and they can come on, you know, and there's healing that has to take place. So I hope that he is getting the help that he needs. I don't know what's going to happen. I know people are speculating that Kim Kardashian is going to divorce him. I mean, I know as a married wife, as a married woman, I should say, relationships go up and down and there's so many things that goes on. So I'm not all for trying to figure out what she's going to do. Because I know that because of the fact that I do believe she does love him. And then in addition to that is that they have children. So when you have kids, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not an advocate for staying with somebody just because you have children. I'm definitely not the advocate for that whatsoever. So, you know, but it can be hard just to pack up and leave. And I know she doesn't have any financial concerns, but that doesn't mean that her, her emotions are not tied, you know, tied into it. So with that being said, I do wish them and Tamar and as well as uh, Connie West the very best. I really do. So this weekend, I will be celebrating my eighth wedding anniversary. And these eight years have been or soon to be eight years have been some of the best times of my life. Right? A lot of highs I've had. Um, we had my we had our daughter before and then we had their other other two children since we've been together and we've known each other for over 20 years and just because we've known each other for 20 years or over 20 years we're still we every day we learn something about each other quite often like you never stop learning about the person that you're with because we all grow you know when people say we grew apart there's a lot of growth that happens that are like up and down with the couple And I know that for the last few years, I've been working on myself. And I wouldn't call it a selfish moment whatsoever. But I do feel like I needed to make sure that my cup was full because I can't give to my husband. And my cup is empty. So I've been really filling my cup with the things that mean the most to me. The things that make me feel really strong and confident. The things that make me the woman that I want to be. And that I'm growing to be. And so... And that growth in these last eight years, our eight years just look look different. Our first year was, I don't want to say horrible, but they weren't the best years, right? And I think everybody has that first couple of struggle years. The first couple of years is like the real struggle years. You know, we were trying to figure out where we're going to stay, where we're going to live, how we're going to build our family. We had a young family. You know, our kids are two years apart. It seemed like every time you looked up, I was pregnant. I have, you know, just get stop getting pregnant. Then you have that moment where you start getting your body together. Then bam, pregnancy comes. And then all the drama that comes from that. Um, So it's been a roller coaster in this last couple of years. And I know that everybody's like, oh, relationships and marriage and marriage and marriage. But you know what? I love my husband with my entire heart. But there's a lot of parts of me that was not fully ready to fully be a wife. Because, you know, this whole ideology, sometimes we glorify weddings more than marriages. My mother was very strict about making sure that she had that conversation with me. Like, don't be putting more emphasis in a wedding than you do your your marriage. 
And, you know, when you hear that, you're just like, yeah, you're right. That sounds so good. You're so right. Don't don't spend all this money trying to get these weddings and then you'd be divorced in a couple of years. It's beyond more than that. You know, when you're putting all of your interest into the wedding and not the marriage, like, do you really know the person that you're about to become one with? Like, do you really know them? It's beyond knowing their favorite color and knowing their favorite meals and knowing how they like certain things and trying to make sure that you, you know, necessarily, you know, live up to this expectation. But you really have to understand what your true expectations in marriage. My expectations was a lot of fluff in the very beginning. You know, we got to get to the first anniversary. We got to have this type of such a new ceremonial situation. We got to have, you know, they cut the first cake. You got to do all these beautiful things in those first year. And in the first year of our marriage, after knowing each other for so long, we still were struggling. Tremendously. Like we were in marriage counseling. We hadn't even been married six months. So that's why I say, you know, marriage is work. It's beyond the lovey-dovey feelings. It's showing up for yourself and showing up for that person. And then I had to learn to show up the way that they needed me to show up, the way my husband needed me to show up. Because for a long time, I was showing up the way I wanted to show up and then use an excuse while I'm here. That's really just counterproductive. He might need to be loved a certain way. I know I needed to be loved a certain way and was not communicating that whatsoever. So we were just bumping heads. Lots of arguments, lots of fussing. And just it really and you know what? And I don't glorify struggle love, right? I just I'm not the type of person that would glorify struggle love. I want people to come together and truly come together because they know themselves. They're solidified in who they are and they are whole. Like this concept of meeting this person, they're going to complete you was how I was living my and most of my marriage in the very beginning. He completes me. Well, for me, and I can only talk for myself, this whole completes me means he completes me. Oh, how does he feel about certain things? Oh, that sounds so cute. Oh, okay, well, that, that I feel the same way. When he met me, I was very opinionated, very strong, very focused. And then it's like you get comfortable. Then you start, well, what does he think? I respect my husband and his thoughts, just like I would hope he respect me and mine. But we can't always, it's not always in a place of flowing into the, like, I can't just make myself appear the way that he would choose for me to appear just to make him happy or to keep the peace. So this whole, this person completes me. What I was, was an incomplete person coming together in a marriage, hoping that the marriage itself and just the union of the marriage, the last name change of the marriage the ring and ceremony of the marriage and all the things that happen when you get married would be enough to complete me, right? That would make me whole. That would make me secure. That would make me feel calm and peace. This would just be the best thing since life's bread and I would be good to go. However, huge pause, <laughs> that not, did not happen. I came into my marriage completely broken with traumas and triggers that I hadn't even explored yet, never even explored to the surface. Then I have these children, and we all know I've talked about it plenty of times, having children, being pregnant, going through postpartum depression, learning that even beyond postpartum depression, I had regular depression. I had all kinds of things happening. And then bringing all of that layers to the table and then to the marriage. I remember, and I've said this before, I believe the last episode about my uh, therapist saying to me, we have to unravel you. And when you become unraveled, you may not be the person that your husband thinks that you are. And you got to be okay with if you become a person that he may not want you to be, or he may not even be the person after you unraveled yourself, he may not be the person that you think that he's supposed to be. Are you going to be okay with going through this process of therapy and then realizing that the person you are does not mesh well with whom he is and you may have to walk away from your marriage. That's real. And you know what's interesting is that we think that because we're married or we're in a relationship with someone, there's a boyfriend or girlfriend, that they're supposed to be on 100% page of full support and that that support is supposed to look like them almost carrying you through some things 
For instance, when I was in my most lowest moment, my husband was very supportive. He did not turn his back on me. But the way that I visioned him carrying me through didn't align up. So then that was another trigger. And what I mean by that is because he didn't appear to be the type of person that held my hand in the way that I thought my hand should be held through this process that was a personal journey, I made my personal journey a complimentary journey and it wasn't a complimentary journey. It was going to be me feeling a lot of times isolated because I'm dealing with things that have nothing to do with him. Remember, I came in the door with this baggage like Erica Badu with the bag lady. You carrying too much in your bag, dragging all them bags like that. I brought all those bags, all those issues, all those layers to the marriage and then it dropped him at his feet and then prayed and just hoped that he would just accept it. Accept it and fix it. That was my biggest thing. Fix it. <laughs> he would ask me all the time, what, do, what would you need for me to do? And I used to irk me when he would ask me that. Because it should have been whatever he, whatever I wanted or felt like I needed him to do. But I was like, well, I don't know. You fix it. How is a man supposed to fix something that he doesn't even know where it's broken? Like you can look at a person and they can look completely whole, but they could have broken pieces and no one knows where that break is. That breaking could be an emotional break. It could be a mental break. It could be all kinds of break. But how is he supposed to know what to fix? One, I wasn't even fully letting him in. Just crying and complaining about how he wasn't fixing it. But you know what? My therapist had to bring that light to the to the table. It was never his job to fix. It was never his job to carry. It was never his job to to do it for me. It was a personal job that he could support me through through it. And there was ways that he didn't support me. And we've had conversations, he and I, about that. There was ways I wasn't even supporting myself and I had conversations with my therapist about that. But a broken person can never, I don't, and, and this is the thing. I could easily say, well, I'm sure he was broken in places. I mean, we all have brokenness in us in some parts, especially if you're not cognitive of yourself and not, not doing a mental check, emotional check, and just checking in on where you are. But I wasn't always being honest about where I was and then still expecting him to just be like Houdini and fix it like, those types of powers don't exist. They do not exist. People cannot come through, come in and just fix everything about what it is that's going wrong with you. So as a spouse, yes, support that person. But sometimes support is not carry. Sometimes support is not fixed. Sometimes support is not, you know, give me the answers. It's just not how it's supposed to work. I had personal work that I had to dig myself through. It was through digging myself through that I could come to the table and then put the marital counseling together. Because while I'm trying to fix my marriage, we were in counseling first as a married couple before I even went into counseling as an individual. Now, I do say you can do both, right? You can start off with marital counseling, but you do need to do some personal counseling. And that's what I had to do. The reality is, is that I should have did the other way around. I should have did some personal counseling so I can b b butt into the person or, uh, turn into the person that I needed to be then I could see where I needed to fix or where, who I was coming with because again I pretty much brought him into a situation where he really didn't know who I was he saw my representative we had history we had love for each other and then therefore it was like this was supposed to be it and this is what's work you know we love each other let's make this work let's be married but I was completely broken I could talk all day about the broken parts but I still expected once I had these broken parts and just supposed to make him the, the super glue to put it all together. Like you can't always love a person to become better. I'm going to say that one more time. You cannot always love a person to become better. So there was times where I felt like the love that I experienced with him was overwhelming. Like I felt so enamored. I was just like, oh my gosh, this man just loves me. It just makes me have all those warm fuzzies. He's withstanding all the, the test of time. He is just being there. He is super great. But sometimes love is not the only thing. You, there's some work. We don't want to work. Like, I know we glamorize because we see all these movies that come together and, and you see the love and the love just carries you through. But you do realize that even in the movie theaters, we just pay. We don't pay much attention to the part where somebody messes up and then somebody has to come back. That comeback is that work. 
we want to skip that part and go straight to the happily ever after. And there will be no happily ever after if there are two people who are unhappy or one person that's unhappy. My happiness cannot be dependent upon whether or not my husband loves me enough to push me through stuff that's personal. My happiness cannot come from if my job is secured enough or if my kids are not, if my kids are okay enough if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. The reality is, is that we have to have that happiness, that work that comes in from the inside. Then when you come from the inside, then it can work and push through the outside. So those are the types of things that I struggle with, which cause our marriage to go up and down and teeter totter from quite, quite, quite a while. Now, again, I say the work came in from myself. I honored myself like my therapist. She had to let me know you have to honor yourself. Give yourself a chance to know who you are. Because like if he's tired of me, that's one thing. But if I'm tired of myself, I can't get mad when he's tired of me, too. Because it's not his job to carry me through every little thing. Support, it doesn't always mean fix. So as we celebrate these eight years, it means a lot to me for us to have done the work. I look at myself in the mirror and I ask myself quite often, if not, I mean, I try to do it every day. But when I don't, I, I keep it in my back of my mind. Like, do you love yourself, this person in the mirror? Do you love yourself enough if that person, my husband, walks away? Of course, I would be hurt. Nobody would state that I'm not. But do I love myself to know that I'm doing the very best and doing what is necessary to show up for myself? And we do a check in now. My husband and I do a check in like. Are we showing up for one another the way that each other needs to be shown up? Because let's face it, we all have our own ideas of what we think that the other person needs or wants from us. But then do you just ever ask? Like some simple, just simply ask, what does that person need? What do you need today? What would you like to happen today? How would you like to see that situation look? So anybody that's here that's married, you've been married long enough to know, or you've had some couple years underneath you. Because remember, even these little eight years is like really just touching the surface. We still babies. In comparison to like my grandparents, who's been married for over 50 something years, in comparison to my parents who've been married for almost 20, over 25 years, we're babies, but you got to start somewhere. So we got to always honor each other and celebrate. Even in a celebration, I can look back on certain years and remember how the celebration went, because again, when you have your own issues, we would have issues even in our at our anniversary dinners like that's not the time to hash out all kinds of carrying on but you know what that comes from too not checking in enough because when you're not checking in enough you should be able to come and celebrate and have something to celebrate instead of trying to hash out all this stuff because you didn't have this moment to hash out to you know to hash out and have these conversations that's where he and I realized we weren't having enough date nights we weren't having enough time where we would just enjoy each other's presence like our marriage is like a lot of fun. It should be a lot of laughs. It should be a lot of happiness in it because the dark times is going to come. You don't need to and do anything extra to add to that, right? It's going to come. Life comes at you and comes at you hard. So we want to do as much as we can to celebrate those moments. So we will be celebrating our eight years this weekend. I'm honored to just be his wife. I'm honored that he is my husband. I'm honored that we have a great system together and that we are great partners that we're making things work and that we've gotten to the point where we no longer mirror our marriage after anyone else's. We mirror the marriage and make the marriage what we choose for it to be and what we choose for it to look like instead of trying to mimic people. Cause I don't know what people do and get to get to the point in their marriage that they are. And to be honest with you, as much as we've had on our plate, I can't afford my plate and their plate too. So I worry about what's on my plate. Worry about watering my, my, my grass. So that's just a little tidbit for marriages, but we've had our moments. I will say where I felt at times where the support, I didn't feel fully supported. 
and there were those times. Then there was a times where I wanted support that I never even communicate. Like, how do you not communicate that you need something, but then get mad the person doesn't give it? Do you hear how crazy that sounds? You need something, but you don't say what you need, but get mad when the need is not met. The need can never be met if you don't speak. The meet need cannot be met without proper communication. So we are constantly learning communication and giving each other a few moments. Take a step back. And for me, not thinking that my husband is my enemy. Like we're on the same team. We're not fighting against each other. We're on the same team. That's helpful too. When you see your partner as the enemy, you won't. It's like you, if you had a real enemy, you would never tell your enemy that you had a problem, right? You would never give any weakness to that enemy. And so you can't really open up to that, to that person. So you close your hand to your own blessing. And I had to, I had to go through that. I had to visit that part of myself and ask myself, is my husband, do I really see him as my husband? Because if I do, we will never make it to year five, six, seven, or eight. So shout out to my therapist for helping me through that. And helping me figure that out without worrying about and even putting on the table that if we should, if at that point, I want to say that was probably year five, five or six. If we had to part ways, I would at least have parted ways by dealing with my issues so that the next person I go to, I'm not picking up the same him. Because I didn't want to attract, even if I didn't, if, if our marriage didn't work, I didn't need to attract another him. If the him, if what's inside of him is not good for me. I hope that makes sense. You will attract the same person in a different body if you don't figure out what's going on inside of you. Because remember, relationships and especially marriages are like mirrors. So what I was seeing in him was things I need to do with myself and then also call his stuff to the rug and allow him to that time to fix him. But if I wasn't going to get myself together, I would basically attract the same man in a different body, however long it would take to attract whomever and build another life with another person and still have that same person be in my same home, regardless of where that home was. So I, I'm not interested in going in circles in my life uh, at almost 40. I'll be 40 next year. I'm not interested in going in circles. This is not. That's not what I'm trying to do. So I've been putting in the work so I can make sure at all times that I'm always constantly checking me first. This week has been a little off. And I say that because although I've had, a, it's been a very interesting week. We've got out the house. We've done a lot of amazing activities. But if I'm honest, at the I think Monday or Tuesday I think I was just so like I felt like I was supposed to be doing more than what I was supposed to be doing like you know that inability to rest and I'm not talking about sleep because I could always use sleep sleep me and sleep don't always you know we get as much sleep as we need as we think we need but I'm talking about like real rest like when you can rest your mind that's the type of rest I'm talking about because remember sleep and rest are two different things you can go to sleep and not rest so Monday and Tuesday, for whatever reason, my spirit, everything just set, seemed kind of like off because I wasn't able to rest. Again, we took a little bit of time off this week. And with that time off, it's just like I couldn't even rest my brain. Like what in the world is going on in my mind that I couldn't rest my brain? So I do the things that I tell everybody in my blog to do. I took a piece of paper out. I wrote my thoughts down and my true thoughts. Like, what was I thinking? What's on my heart? What's on my mind that won't allow me to rest? What is, when am I not resting? What am I thinking about? So I wrote it down on a piece of paper, started writing out. First, I just wrote down the, the ideas and I went back and then wrote out the details of how my brain was thinking at those moments. Then when I saw it on black and white, like just in paper, I was just like, wait a minute. So these are not like high risk things. So there's people right now going through things like loss of job, not knowing how they're going to feed their family. And although my situations weren't as serious as those things, even when I looked at them just on the surface, they weren't even serious for whatever I had. Even for my life, it wasn't serious. So I asked myself, you got to Wednesday, 
You know, allowed yourself this your mindset to just be kind of off and in left field. So now you're gonna waste the rest of your 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 almost like vacation week, because it really doesn't feel like a real vacation when you're like not even that you can't go anywhere, but just because of everything that's going on in the world, it just doesn't seem fair or okay to have like a vacation. But I needed to try to find out how to rest myself. So by the time I got to Wednesday, I was like, wait, you wasted Monday and Tuesday. You did fun things, but you literally wasted yourself. Your being present moment, like being present, being there and really finding a way to just relax a little bit, to take and let your hair down, let your guard down and just have your mind at rest and at peace. So by the time Wednesday came, I was like, hold up. Now I don't waste Monday and Tuesday. This is ridiculous. I'm going to come back and Monday is going to hit and I'm going to go back to my schedule that is very intense and then be mad that I'm in an intense schedule with no rest period. So I had to take some time back to step back and say to myself, let's get it together. Because we literally waste some time. We waste our own time trying to figure out stuff that just some of it is just not as high on the plate as much as we put our thought process to it. Again, your situation doesn't have to be as dire as some people in the country where you're like, again, they're having shown up situations that are life changing, but they could still mean something to you. But then even on you, even for myself, what I was thinking about made no sense. Didn't it didn't add to my situation. It didn't. It was actually just hindering it because how are you just not allowing yourself to rest? That's stress. That's stress. So I had to ask myself, what in the world are you allowing yourself to be stressed out about? Like, you cannot make your life hard like night. You just cannot make your your life hard right now. As much as the news and everything else that's out there, there's so much going on. You just don't need to add to your plate like this. And especially when I can control it. So this week was about maintaining my thought process to stop allowing things to overtake my mind. To stop allowing things to overtake my heart. To stop trying to put every minute and having myself think about what will move. You got to do this and do that. Like I know that as far as like building like with my brand, with like my blogs and things of that sort and just life and work and kids and family and motherhood and wifehood and all those other things. They are all very intense. But that doesn't mean that my mind has to go so far that I can't take a step back and just say, wait a minute. So that was the goal this week. Once I figured out what was happening, because like I said, for two days, I could not get it together. Then it was just like irritability was coming in. I was physically starting to get tired. But it was because I was dealing with a stress and the stress was more induced, like more personally induced stress. So I had to take a step back and say, this is not going to help me to stress myself out like this. Now, I don't know if it was like because of the stuff with the kids in the school, like it's a number of things. When I wrote the list, it was a number of things. Again, some things were truly valid, like me stressing out whether or not my kids was going to be able to go to their same school or I was going to have to pull them out or I was going to have to just do an old school homeschool program or whatever the case may be and put them in public school because they were offering online. Like there's a lot of factors with just that one decision. Yes, that is something to be in thought process about, right? That is something that you can stress out about. But there were other things that were in my mind that once I wrote them down, just did not have as much validity as I was giving, like I was giving myself to think that like it's everything is just going crazy. Like, wait a minute. One thing is going crazy. Two things are going crazy. Them other three you made up. Them other three you can, you can, there's a solution for it. Just get into the solution mode and then keep it pushing. Like, wait a minute. What's our answer here? What's our, what's our angle? Let's fix this and then let's find a way to move along. Because, like I said, it just did not need to be this overwhelming feeling. So I'm glad I took the time out to get the thought process together. And really think about what it is that I needed to do. But yet carve out time for real relaxation and for real rest. I'm so grateful for taking that moment. I'm so grateful for even having the mindset to even recognize it and then do something about it. Stop it dead in its tracks. Because we don't stop enough in our life. We let some things just continue to happen. We let people to continue to walk in and take advantage of certain things. 
We allow people to put things on our schedule that we already knew in our spirit. We didn't want to, we didn't have the time for do, to do, or we didn't want to do. So this is the reason why I'm great, grateful for the, the place in my life that I'm at, where I can pick and choose the things that I want to entertain. I can put aside a, a lot of the things that I don't have the energy for. In reality, some things I just don't want to do. So I've decided if it doesn't feed my soul, doesn't help my children become healthier, doesn't help my marriage, and doesn't help for personal growth, and it's just something I don't want to do and I have no desire to do it, I'm not going to force myself to do it. Especially in this blog and influencing world, which is the reason why I've always been the type that said you just why you can't push on and pull on every product. Everybody that sends you an email, I've had several emails. I think I've had more emails in quarantine than any other time ever. Today is the last day of July. And tomorrow will be August the 1st. The fact that we're already in August is crazy to me. Like August the 1st is tomorrow. This is crazy. And with that, it's like time is going, even though sometimes it feels like it's not. Especially with things like COVID and the pandemic and everything going on in hot spots and schools. And will the election happen in November? And what's going to happen? And how's the new year going to look? And how's Christmas going to look? And what's even, you know, there's so many things, so many factors. I'm just shocked and all that we're in the place that we're at. And honestly, I thought we would be done with everything, especially like with the pandemic. I thought we were going to hunker down and get everything situated. But now we see that we're not. Then they keep talking about a second wave. I don't know how true that is, but I'm preparing as if there's one. Because I felt like I was semi unprepared. Because, you know, we were being told, oh, you know, a couple of weeks, we should be good. So I felt there was a lot of ways in which I was not prepared. So should a second wave or a second lockdown come? I'm trying to figure out what did I do correctly the first time so I can do it correctly this time. Like, how am I going to put more self-care in place to get through another shutdown? Because for some people, should this whole pandemic thing has been completely lonely. If it's not from just the fear of getting COVID, it could be a a number of things. And I just pray that we get more mental health uh, professionals in place because people are going to need it. I haven't seen like anything that suggested that numbers have gone up since COVID as far as like mental health issues or like suicide. I haven't seen any of those. I'm going to probably try to research that for the next time because I don't want this whole thing to always be doom and gloom. Like this is not what the purpose of this is. But I mean, we have to talk about the things that people won't talk about because there are real people out here really suffering in silence. As much as we want to rally behind Kanye and Tamar Braxton, they're just an example of the people who don't have celebrity status, who don't have platforms that go through these things and they're not seen, they're not heard, they're lonely, they're frustrated, they're agitated. They don't understand what's happening. They have no one that they feel like they can honestly speak to that can shed some light on it. And they are struggling. So this is the reason why I haven't tried to make this be about fully mental health every single day. But because there's so many people who are suffering silence, it would be a miss for me to have conversations and not talk about the things that I've learned, the things that I've gotten through without talking about that. Because I can teach anybody how to open up and, and make a blog, right? I could teach you the things that I've learned in that blog. I can even make a class out of it. I could teach someone certain recipes and things that I may have learned or made that I may have underneath my belt. I could show someone a beautiful picture on my Instagram and say, look, look how life is doing. We're good. But this beyond the pictures on an Instagram post and beyond how we move and beyond the things that are tangible, there are some ins- inside things that happen between our minds and our hearts. And when they collide, sometimes it can travel over to the physical, making us sick, making us nauseous, having all things going in our wrong in our body with no explanation. You'll have all these tests like I did when I was in I think right after I graduated, I had every test run. I had my appendix taken out. I had my gallbladder taken out. I had all kinds of things happening because the pain was mimicking that something was wrong. But then when they went in, they discovered that at least with the appendix, that nothing was wrong. 
and the stress and losing your hair and then you're, you know, you're breaking out and you got all these different things happening on the, on the outside of your body as a reflection of what's happening on the inside of your body, what's happening on your mind. So that's the reason why I push so hard to keep talking about it because there's somebody listening to this and is at the breaking point of trying to break. And the things that have gone on in these last, um, within this year, 2020, is enough to break a person. When we were having the the riots and the looting and, you know, everyone protesting, it made my spirit became three times heavier. And that was with fighting COVID, right? Fighting racism, fighting COVID. That was a lot. It's still a lot. It's not like they, either one of them has stopped. But it just made me, because we were sitting, right? It's like we were always on go. A lot of the things that have happened have not just started happening. They're becoming more apparent, but they just didn't just start. But we were on um, quarantine. We were in, you know, stay at home orders. And so with these stay at home orders, it made us stop. So we were able to tap into humanity for some of us. Lots of us were able to tap into humanity. We were able to hear things that we have heard before, but actually finally hear them. We were able to sit down and calm ourselves down enough to hear stories and truly hear them because we've heard the news before. We've heard about deaths. We've heard about George Floyd's in many different cases. We've heard about the Breonna Taylor's in the many different cases. There's been more Breonna Taylor's before Breonna Taylor was Breonna Taylor. And I'm not taking light of her, of her death at all, or George, uh, George Floyd. Their death is igniting a nation to either come together or to separate. True story. You see the people that's for it or there's people that's against it. There is no middle. There is no, well, I'm for this part, but not that part. It's either you're for or you're against. And so with all the separation that's going on, it's separating friends from friends, it's separating family from families. And it's isolating people greater ways than it has ever done before. COVID is literally like actually literally separating families, whether that's people that are getting sick that now have to continue being completely separate or whether that's unfortunate situation where people have passed on. And the anguish and the pain and the trauma that we are in one of the richest countries in the world and we can't get a hold of a, a of a viral infection. We're losing Americans way quicker than anything that we've had in a long time. And I know people want to compare it to the flu. When you get the flu and the flu season is coming up, when the flu season comes, it's going to be even worse because you're not going to be able to tell the difference between a cold, the flu, or COVID. Everybody and their mama going to think they have COVID. They're going to label a lot of things COVID that may not even be COVID because it's going to mimic the same things. That's, I think about that when I'm thinking about when I was talking about my kids going back to school. My kids have asthma. So when spring, I mean, when September and October comes is when my kids get the sickest the most. Then they get really sick again about January, February when it gets extremely cold. So what I may consider them to just be a cold or just a a, a, a influx of their asthma could be a number of things now is it flu you know they'll get their flu shot is it a cold is it COVID the thought process of me even thinking about how those months are about to pop is just the thought of that I'm already putting into prayer and some type of self-care because that is a lot we're not even thinking about that all we want to do is make these arguments and say well I saw in something in the article that said a b and c you know what? There's a lot of articles that come out. Some good, some bad, some based on science, some based on opinion, some based upon whatever droplets in the air. Things that people make up. Things that sound good. But the reality of it is, is that when those things happen, when those things are shared, when those things are posted, when those things are uploaded, now we have conspiracy theories. We got people that's doing it for political gain. We got people doing it to do for whatever reason. You know what that does? Causes stress, 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 and more stress. So why do I talk about that? Because those people are just like me. They're just like you, whether you want to admit it or not, that are sitting up here stressed, stressed, stressed because of all the stuff that's going on around them and they feel hopeless. There's nothing I can do to make the CDC tell Trump or tell Trump to tell the CDC to work together. There's nothing I can do to do that. And this is not about Trump or not Trump. This is just the facts. I can't make these people come together to make a plan to make us better. Because when they do put stuff out, we don't listen. 
we like one of them hard-headed kids that just don't listen. So when we get put out and, and we get on punishment again, then everybody's going to be mad and pissed. But we don't listen. We don't want to wear a mask. It's our, not, it's, it's our right to not wear it. Okay. Then when people end up getting it, and that's what has happened, then we're mad and upset and uproar. The point is, is that we can't get everybody on the same page. And we're not talking about being on the same different pages when it comes to opinion. We're talking about being on the same page when we're talking about facts. We don't know a lot about COVID. You know how I know? Because if we did, we would be honoring certain parts of it that we that were that are facts, but we're not putting our, our emphasis behind that. So now everybody does what they want to do. Florida does one thing. New York does another thing. L.A. does something else. Phoenix does something else. Philadelphia and Pennsylvania does something else. And then the story continues. So we're not fighting anything. We're trying to survive the, the survival of the fittest. It's just like clearing up the population at this point. I want my family to be in the next season and the next season and the next season that I possibly can. I want your family to have the same thing. But this undue stress is happening all around us. So we have to do things like self-care. I'm not talking about just taking a bubble bath and then painting your, tail, your, your nails and then saying you good to go. Yes, those things help. They are part of it. They're not the only parts. Self-care sometimes makes you also have to be self-aware. When you see yourself going to a place that's a place of darkness, what can you do in the midst of before your spirit takes all the way over to darkness? What can you do to bring yourself back over to the light? That is real self-care. That is beyond a bubble bath. That is beyond reading a magazine. That is beyond reading a good book. That is beyond putting on music. That is beyond taking a walk. That is beyond that. Those are apparatuses that get you there, but you need to understand that it's, it's, it's just that it's that quick. What can you do to bring yourself into the light or keep yourself into light so that you don't step into darkness? Because the second you step into this darkness, it became overwhelming. And then it could be that much harder to get all the way out. I know because I've been there. So what do you do for self-care, real self-care that takes you from that moment of darkness to that moment of happiness? Yes, you can read a book and take you there. Yes, you can do some exercise and take you there. But after you've painted your nails and after you've taken that bubble bath, have you really gotten to the nitty gritty of where you are and how you can truly fix yourself from where you don't step into that darkness or at least step in it a little bit and pull yourself out enough where you don't stay there? Because there's some people who are stuck in that darkness and can't see the light. That's when they start to feel hopeless. That is the very definition of being hopeless. You don't see hope. You don't see happiness. You don't see any good that's coming. You just don't feel like you're worthy. You don't feel like you're, you know, bringing anything to the society. You don't think you, it don't feel like you matter. These are the, the signs of what pushes somebody f into true stages of, of depression where they stay stuck. And if you're hearing my voice right now, I understand that feeling. But there's always something that can bring you back. But if you feel like you can't get back, please get in contact with a therapist. Because you're going to need somebody that's going to help you get manage yourself or give you the tools that you can be better at managing yourself to pull you back into that good light. If you're lonely, me telling you to go take a shower or go work out or go spend out 10 minutes outside may not work for you because you got to come back into that quiet home, back into that quiet apartment. But there be, might be a multiple of things that you can do. There might be some layers of things that you can work through that can get you from feeling completely hopeless and bring you back to light. That is what the conversations should be about. Because when I talk to my friends, I don't want to just say, hey, hey, girl, how you doing? They say, I'm good. And you just go on. I want to know, how are you really doing? I want to check in with myself daily and say, Toy, how are you feeling? Are you Okay. So we know that you're not okay. Why are you not okay? What's going through your mind? It's like the exercise where I wrote everything down and wrote the way that I was feeling first surface, then went back and rewrote everything, you know, under the surface and then dealt with the fact that when I read and saw from black and white, it didn't make sense for me to be in the place that I'm at. So, okay, let's start to double itself out. How can I get to a better place from feeling all over the place?
that's the reality of what somebody needs to hear. Because in other words, they're hearing people say, you shouldn't be feeling that way. You're alive. You should be grateful. Gratefulness is a beautiful tool. And I explore and employ everyone to try to do a gratefulness uh, journal or write down three things that makes you grateful. I'm using an app. It's called how, how Are You Feeling or How Do You Feel? I'm not sure where this app came from or where I got a hold to it. And you know what? It's really, let me, not, let me backtrack. It, it is an app. I have to find it. I'll bring it back for next week. But it asked me every single day. I think it was somebody invented it for COVID. And so it asked me, you know, how are you feeling? Are you good or are you bad? I would do the check mark. Then it would say, have you been in contact with anybody who's been sick or anything like that? And it asked all the COVID symptoms. And then normally I hit no, well, not normally, every day I've been hitting no symptoms. Then I thought maybe they should really add some extra questions. So then they did. I don't know if they heard me. I'm sure they didn't. Then they asked more questions. How they had like 10 feelings, optimistic, anxiety, lonely, um, anger, sadness, a bunch of bunch of feelings. And then you had to swipe your hand to say how much of this, these feelings are you feeling. Then it would say, you know, life is hard, but what are two things that you're grateful for? So maybe you don't have the app because you don't know the name of the app. But that's really how you figure out how do you actually feel. And that's how you write everything down. So that you can get to the place where you can really figure out where you are and how you truly feel. But I like that because then it was, you know, I would write down something that I was grateful for, two things. And I made sure that my feelings were different every day. I can't say oh, I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful for myself. Or I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful for my husband. Those are great things. But I try to be intentional in saying other things. Um, so that I could get to the place where I'd be like, okay. Let me write this down so I can figure out how, how I feel. I think it's more like a contract, a contact tracing app, but it's HWF, how we feel. So how we feel is the name of the app, how we feel. If you can, if you can download that on your phone, you will be doing yourself a great justice because it, it asks you to set the time that you want to, for the app to pop up and ask you how you feel. So I set it for nine o'clock every morning. I'm usually up way above nine o'clock every single day. So I've had time to either pray. I've had time to make my bed. I've had time to get dressed. I've had time to have my coffee. I've had time to calm down and have that quiet time with myself because the kids are not in school. So they're sleeping in a little later. So by the time the nine o'clock comes and it does this check in, it literally will ask you all these different questions. So it allows me to really figure out first thing in the morning for myself where I am. But even if you don't have the app, you don't want another app on your phone, you're tired of apps, literally write down. It asks you, have you been in contact with someone else outside of your home? You can th say things. I went to my doctor. I went to the nail salon. I went to a restaurant, whatever the options are. Ask you about your COVID symptoms. It then ask you again, are you feeling okay? Are you feeling bad? Then it asks you the cert, you know, the be under the surface questions of, Okay, how optimistic are you? How happy are you? How sad are you? How frustrated are you? How lonely are you? And you literally swipe it across according to your feelings. But it's a great visual tool to help you do that. And I do that by writing that down. Most of the times before I even got a hold of the app, the app now just becomes a visual representation of what I'm already doing. So how are you truly feeling? And this is the time to really get close to your friends, even if it's via phone. Although, trust me, I miss my friends so much it's just sheer madness right now I miss my family so much and not being able to really get around them too much or I, I actually haven't seen my family in quite some time and I've said that before I think in the next week I will be making arrangements to go have a visit with them hopefully if everything stays the same if it changes then I have to change too but Try to put more in place. Like right now, we all can't get together, but try to do a lot of FaceTime. I know people are getting sick of FaceTime because it's not the same, but it beats a blank. But connect with your family, connect with your friends, 
Sometimes friends are like family, especially for me. Friends are like family for me. So connect, ask the real questions, dedicate yourself to talking to at least one or two friends a week. If you can, not more. Maybe you have friends like some of my friends just truly do not talk on the phone. They're just like texting people, but then still ask some serious questions. Maybe they'll lead themselves off of text to talk. Whatever it is that you can do to stay connected to somebody, if it's just one person, do that. It'll make the difference of feeling like you're in a world all completely by yourself. You don't need a whole lot of numbers. You need solid numbers. Like if I have six solid friends, I'm rich in friendship. Not having 20 friends who are all fleeks. Because you don't need the numbers. You need the solid relationships. You need genuine relationships. People who truly, truly love you and truly, truly will have your back. So this week, how are you really, truly feeling? What does that look like for you when you're not feeling the way you're supposed to feel? And what are you doing to to turn that around so that you don't step into the path of darkness, but bring yourself back into light? We all get challenged with that every day, every moment, at every decision-making process. Big or small or in between, we all deal with those same questions that we should be asking ourselves that all the time. How do you truly, truly feel? What are you doing in the midst of feeling bad? How do you bring yourself to back to feeling the way you're supposed to feel, which is trying to feel as good as you possibly can? So I know it's a little bit heavy. I know we've gotten to Friday, but you know what? We made it. And so now we can reflect on what the things that got us to this Friday, the things that we didn't do okay with once we got to this Friday throughout the first part of the week, what we're going to do to get to ourselves through the weekend, what does that even look like? And then how are we going to challenge ourselves to become better for this next week until we come back again? Like, did you write down for, if you didn't do any of this last, this up last week, what are you going to do next week? Are you going to maybe take some paper or even just jot in notes, a couple notes on your phone about how you're feeling and what you're truly putting in for real self-care that's beyond superficial self-care, that point where it brings you from darkness to happiness or darkness to light? How can you address yourself? And I'm not talking about get clothes on, address yourself. How can you address the things that are going on inside of you so that you can be a better human? Because we don't need that many more trash humans. There's plenty of those in the world. But how can you address yourself so that you can be better? We have the power, literally, to make ourselves so much more better. But if we don't have the tools, if we lack the tools, we need to get somebody to help us. That's when therapy, let's make therapy, let's normalize that. Let's not say, oh, that person needs because she's crazy. It's crazy in all of us, to some extent. But we got to get better. We got to become whole individuals, not broken pieces trying to deal with other people. We need to be whole, centered, and better. So happy anniversary. (laughs) Said all that to say. Happy anniversary to my husband, who is completely solid, becoming a better partner every day. As we walk into this new journey of year eight, may God continue to bless us every single moment. That we don't just walk this walk for the sake of keeping our children together. That we walk this walk so that when the children walk and leave and make their own lives, that we are two individuals that truly love and like each other. Because like and love is two different things, people. Like and love. I hope that you have a good weekend. I hope that you have a great week next week. We will be back next Friday. Another happy Friday. So we could talk some more. So we can come together, so we can check ourselves, so we can have those difficult conversations. Love to Tamar, sending out my love and and strength to Tamar. She continues to heal and hoping that Kanye, even though he's been quiet, I pray that it stays that way for a little while while he's healing. And I hope that he's getting the help that he needs. And to all the other Kanye's and to all the other Tamar's in this world, that everybody's getting the help that they need. I love you guys. Happy Friday.
Thank you as always for joining me. And I know that even in the deepest or joyful conversations, that there's something we can learn and apply. Until next time, I hope that you are doing better. If not, we will be back to talk some more and handle it. Peace to you and yours. Stay grounded.